<clears throat> so good morning. I'm Kave Koshnud. I'm a faculty member at the Yale School of Public Health. I have the honor of uh, chairing this distinguished panel, our first panel this morning. I also want to personally thank Henan for all the work she's done over the last couple of months to getting us here. And I really want to appreciate both opening remarks from George as well as Catherine. Um, George, by telling us the importance of coming together, getting out of our silos, um, and Catherine reminding us that we all have a contribution to make and to learn from one another, so thank you. Um, the bios of our panelists are in your uh, books. I'm not going to, to read um, their bios. You can see who they are. The, the title is for this panel is uh, both the legal and health challenges facing refugees and asylum seekers in the United States. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the legal aspects of it. Um, some of the legal issues facing refugees and asylum seekers would be addressed by the second panel, which is after the keynote. Um, but for those of you who always wonder the difference between an asylum seeker and refugee, you are going to get some insight about that uh, from the first panel. But we're really going to focus on some of the health issues. And we're very fortunate to have um, three physicians with us. Uh, who will be speaking, uh, I think Dr. McKenzie is going to go first, talking about um, sort of medical forensic evaluation for asylum seekers, the whole process, how does it work, what are the, some of the anticipated challenges in the future. Then Dr. Anamalai will talk about medical care, provision of medical care for refugees, provide some important background, and again talk about some of the anticipated challenges uh, and changes going forward. And Dr. Prabhu, We'll talk about mental health needs of both asylum seekers and refugees. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. McKenzie. Thank you, Kaveh. I'm Kate McKenzie. I'm the director of Yale Center for Asylum Medicine. And I'm going to take a few minutes today to talk about um, medical evaluations of asylum seekers, and then some of the <clears throat> anticipated challenges that we have foreseen with the new administration. <clears throat> I start with this slide and listening to speakers who've already spoken to talk about how there is um, a humanitarian impulse to provide refuge and safety to asylum seekers. And this has been an impulse that is basic to our, our humanity over thousands of years. <clears throat> in fact, each year, tens of thousands of people from around the world seek refuge, seek humanitarian relief from deportation so that they can rebuild their lives in the United States. This vulnerable group includes survivors of torture, domestic abuse, trafficking, and other forms of persecution. Many have suffered unimaginable physical and psychological torture in their countries of origin. Even if they can afford an attorney, they face the daunting task of providing detailed, independently corroborated evidence of harm as required by the government. If they're sent back to their countries of origin, they face further persecution, even death. Medical evaluations of asylum seekers significantly increase the likelihood that asylum will be granted. Our group at the medical school, Yale Center for Asylum Medicine, is comprised of faculty members, students, fellows, residents, <laughs> and what we try to do is use a physician's unique expertise to give asylum seekers a chance for a new life free of fear. Just going to take a couple minutes to talk about uh, uh, an asylum applicant we saw a couple years ago in our center to give you kind of the context of the work that we do. This man came from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and lived under a very repressive autoc autocratic government. And he did what so many of us do, especially in the last few months, he decided to protest against his government. He became a member of an opposition political party. And one day they uh, had a, a peaceful protest. And government officials then gathered 
at the protest site and arrested him and many other of the protesters. And what it resulted in was for him five days of detention, interrogation, and torture. He was taken in interrogation room a couple times a day. His life was threatened. He was um, beaten severely. He was cut. He was burned. It was so overwhelmingly painful, traumatic. He was filled with fear. As soon as that ended, he realized that he had to leave the DRC, and he decided to come to the United States to seek refuge, to seek shelter from his persecution. He was able to find an attorney here in um, Connecticut, and when talking to his attorney and talking about his torture, he was able to tell the attorney what had happened, and the attorney realized he had some physical scars and mental scars as well. So <coughs> the we have already read about his recount of persecution, his account of persecution. We then hear it ourselves, and then we perform a physical exam. So that's what we did with Mr. A.T. We examined him, and we saw the scars of the physical torture he had experienced. He showed us on his leg a scar from being cut with a bayonet. He showed us also scars on his foot where he was burned. So we use international guidelines then to gather that information in history and physical exam. We document it on a body diagram and with photographs, as you saw. And then we create a medical legal affidavit, which we provide to his attorney. And that medical legal affidavit becomes part of his asylum claim, his asylum appeal. And in fact, together with the information that we gathered and which we provided to his attorney, he was granted asylum. So that kind of encapsulates in a, in a very uh, brief way the work that we do, medical evaluations of asylum seekers. And in fact, a recent study have sh has shown that people who are able to have medical evaluations as part of their asylum appeal are almost three times more likely to be granted asylum. So all of us in the last few months have been living in a, a state of uncertainty about where our country is going in many regards. I think we can understand that. But when you think of the life and the experience of an asylum seeker, it's so tenuous to begin with. They're in legal limbo. Their families are usually back where they came from. They're just living in uncertainty. So superimpose that on the setting of, on our political setting at this time. And the uncertainty is just compounded. So I can't tell you how the experience of asylum seekers is going to change in the next four years. But we can certainly say that um, it's likely to change significantly. So I'm not an attorney, but I understand a little bit about the legal background. And certainly, if there's attorneys here who want to clarify a little bit, feel free to speak up. But when someone initially appeals for asylum, speaks with an immigration official, and says, I'd like to claim asylum, they have to go through what's called a credible fear test to show that there's a likelihood they will be persecuted if they're returned to their home country. And there's certainly indications that the bar will be raised, which that sort of credible fear test, there's some sub subjectivity to it. Is it going to be much more <coughs> difficult for people at the initial time when they want to appeal for asylum will be given the chance to do so? We certainly anticipate that the asylum process, which actually can be many years long, sometimes it's just a year, but it certainly can be a year or two or three, when it actually occurs that the immigration officials will be much more adversarial. Certainly there is indication that that might be the case, uh, given various pro policies that President Trump has proposed, as well as what we've heard in his campaign rhetoric. Greater need for documentation, that's where we come in. We certainly try to provide objective evidence that there has been persecution, and we anticipate that documentation will become even more important. We've also already seen that detention policies are going to be much stricter. And one part of that is, for example, on the southern border, as families are often coming across the border, uh, there's indication they may be separated, which uh, 
compounds the stress and the fear that they already have. Imagine being separated from your children. Increased time in detention, that certainly might happen as well. And there certainly is indication that fewer people will even come to the United States. This country that we all believe should be a beacon of hope for those people who have been persecuted. Many people will decide it's not even worth it to come to the United States. The policies are so uncertain and the official policy of our government is so hostile. So these are some ideas of what we might be facing in the next uh, almost four years. So finally, just to summarize, when we perform medical evaluations of asylum seekers, we follow international guidelines to determine consistency of history and examination in order to determine the likelihood of human rights violations. And as Physicians for Human Rights, one of our strong partners, stated so closely, so well, we work at the intersection of medicine, forensic science, and human rights. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, as uh, Professor Krishnath briefly introduced me, um, I am faculty on the School of Medicine, and um, clinically I practice both internal medicine and psychiatry, uh, both of which skills come in very useful for me uh, in the clinical care of refugees. You'll be hearing next from Maya Prabhu, uh, who's my colleague within psychiatry who helps me uh, perform some of those psychiatric evaluations. Um, as you probably realized by this time, uh, all of us on this panel are talking about the work we do uh, for refugees and asylum seekers here, uh, you know, within this, within uh, the country. And you'll be hearing a range of experts um, about uh, people both here and abroad during the course of the day. Uh, but Dr. McKenzie, as she mentioned, she, um, evaluates asylum seekers here. What I do here is I provide clinical care for refugees who are already here. And just very quickly, uh, the legal difference is just that uh, refugees are here uh, because they've been uh, legally accepted as a refugee by the United Nations, and then they've been welcomed by the United States for entry into the country, uh, which is a little bit different from the asylum seekers that. Dr. McKenzie evaluates uh, because they're here seeking asylum. They're not yet legally recognized as refugees. They're fighting for that status. But as far as health goes, I mean, they're almost similar in terms of the health uh, conditions that we might be seeing and we might be dealing with. So many of you here, or at least some of you have heard me talk about uh, just the health of refugees. This is going to be very brief because this is a panel discussion and we want to invite questions. I'm just going to say briefly what we see and what we do in clinic. Uh, but for those of you who may not know, I just, uh, I know there's a lot of words here, but this is just a pictorial representation of what a refugee goes through uh, once, you know, uh, once the United Nations actually um, accepts them as a refugee and then they go through this whole process before they actually get resettled into uh, a country. What happens is usually a refugee uh, crosses their country's borders because they're fleeing, and then they're in this in limbo in a secondary country, and that's when they're going through this process, and some of them get resettled. And unfortunately, it's a very, very, very small fraction of refugees in the world that actually get resettled to a third country, including the United States. I mean, the U.S. is one of several countries. Um, so. There's, there's multiple steps, and that's, this can take anywhere from a year and a half to four years or more. Uh, some of our refugees have been in limbo for, for a decade or two. Uh, I just want to point out, um, just in relation to health, uh, number five on the slide is actually um, talking about medical screening that refugees undergo overseas. Uh, you may have heard from other people that Refugees are actually one of the migrant groups that are very, very heavily vetted, security-wise. But actually, medical screening also, they're more vetted than most other, actually all, any other migrant groups in terms of just screening for health conditions. So they are not coming in with communicable diseases, uh, and they are not in any way a health hazard uh, to, uh, to people that are already here. Uh, so this is just, again, just a 
colorful pictorial way of showing where within the US, and this is a little bit older, this is still 2015, um, and um, <laughs> you can see the, the darkest blue are the states that actually are getting the highest number of refugees, the very light blue are the ones that are um, getting uh, the least number of refugees, and uh, Connecticut is sort of uh, on the lower end, not because, I mean, as, as you know, uh, generally the governor and you know, generally Connecticut has been welcoming of refugees. It's just because of the size of the state. Larger states tend to get, you know, more number of refugees typically. Um, and there's also been lots of changes in numbers in the last year and a half simply because of a lot of things that have been happening uh, politically. So um, what we do here is uh, we partner as, as a university and as the Yale Human Hospital with IRIS, which is the local resettlement agency, uh, Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services. And actually, I think the health coordinator from there just walked in. <laughs> she's, she's just looking in. <laughs> um, so we, we've been in partnership with them for many years. Uh, we actually, a group of trainees actually at the hospital started uh, the clinic be because uh, we wanted to have a dedicated clinic to provide clinical care. And Dr. Rastegar actually has been uh, one of the guiding mentors of the clinic. Uh, he's going to be on a panel later today. So our purpose is to establish these refugees within our healthcare system once they come in. And uh, there, there is also actually a mandated screening that they have to undergo that the Department of State does require. Uh, but the main purpose of our uh, screening really is to establish them within healthcare. They may or may not have, uh, you know, had good healthcare on their way here. There, there's varying levels depending on on their route. Um, so they get a screening overseas, then they get a screening with us, and they get longitudinal care. And uh, within our partnership, uh, how we've structured it is all the refugees within the greater New Haven area essentially come through the Yale New Haven hospital system. Um, so just talking about, you know, maybe potential changes we might see. Well, the most obvious changes, obviously, we're going to see fewer number, potentially. I mean, we don't know. This is a changing landscape. Um, but what does that mean for us? I mean, what it really means uh, for the refugees who come here is that they might be delayed somewhere. I mean, they might be in Jordan. Lebanon, Egypt, wherever it may be, you know, potentially with health conditions that they don't have the resources to address appropriately. So it's, there's a delay in care. And just anecdotally, we know people with diabetes who, you know, maybe haven't been able to get insulin all the time and who had fluctuating levels of care. Uh, we see that as, as a population, I mean, I can say delay in care is it's not good. I mean, it's hard to encapsulate this in numbers. Um, but just, just from clinical experience, I can say that that's you know, definitely detrimental. And um, also, we've seen on the people who are already here, sometimes they're separated for families. They've already come here. They've been accepted, and they've been waiting for the families. And maybe now with you know, more restrictions, more stringent criteria, maybe their families won't make it. Uh, so you know, we've definitely seen, again, anecdotally, people, you know, maybe having to go to the hospital, especially in the initial days of the new administration when there was a lot of changes and when, um, you know, uh, there was this potential ban on uh, entry of refugees. We definitely did see people in distress, uh, people who were already here, even though, you know, they were in safety. And also, I think, uh, to some extent, uh, they did feel a little unsettled because they were not sure how welcome they were anymore. Um, even though the country had, you know, quote unquote, welcomed them um, as a refugee. And then I think the, the last thing, which is also not uh, in any way uh, the least important, is uh, basically what another potential thing that might change is, you know, the Affordable Health Care Act. We don't know where it's going. Uh, but if things do change, as it's going to affect all Americans, it's going to affect refugees too. Because as things stand now, they, do, they are eligible for um, uh, medical assistance for the first eight months, uh, which is essentially sort of the state, each state's uh, uh, in state insurance Medicaid program, which is what uh, makes it uh, possible for them to access health care within the first several months. And what happens after that uh, is usually they are eligible, like 
all other Americans to uh, buy insurance from the marketplace and, you know, because of their low income, um, which is true for all of them in the first few years, they are then able to access a lot of the benefits available for low income people. And so all of this might change. And uh, generally with fewer resources, you know, fewer, less funding, um, we might also have difficulty with accessing additional um, resources like interpreters, for example. That's a big challenge as it is for us uh, because those of you who are practicing physicians will know uh, that unfortunately a lot of healthcare is still based on uh, reimbursement and revenue. Uh, and when we actually need to uh, spend more time and resources on um, uh, engaging interpreter services in the clinic, uh, that's usually not conducive for clinics uh, financially. And that, that, that's a whole other topic in itself, but that's one of the challenges we find when we are referring refugees elsewhere for care. Uh, we are we're lucky within Yale New Haven Hospital to actually have a lot of those resources. So that's another thing that might be indirectly affected uh, with, with changing landscape of uh, healthcare. So I'm going to actually uh, stop there, and then after the last speaker, if you have more specific questions about uh, what I said, we, we can talk more. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Maya Prabhu. I'm one of the psychiatry attendings in the refugee clinic. And I work with Ani um, and Kate. Uh, less frequently do I see Kate. It's a pleasure to see her here. And I wanted to speak a little bit about the mental health needs. I'm going to focus primarily on resettled refugees, but I'm happy to answer questions on asylum seekers. And I'll try to draw distinctions and differences as they come up in the presentation. So this audience will be aware that, of course, mental health refugees have a variety of experience, a variety of traumas or distresses in their life, which can lead to mental health concerns. I think we're probably most familiar with what I call the pre-resettlement stresses, the, the challenges or the situations or the experiences that led people to leave their country, often in the middle of the night, whether it was the experience of being detained, whether it's the experience of, being, of experiencing violence or observing violence, um, um, harassment or deprivation, whatever those cases might have been, people are familiar with it. And of course, those are often the primary traumas which people then present to our clinic with mental health symptoms for. However, I wanted to emphasize that refugees actually experience layers of trauma at different stages in the process of leaving their home country to arriving in the United States. So the experience of flight itself is deeply traumatizing and distressing. They may have had to leave family members behind. They may have had to make choices about what they're going to bring. They certainly do. They will, may have had to travel over land or over sea. You've seen those boats capsizing in the Mediterranean. And people may have seen death or have become close to death themselves. We know that flight itself is, are, presents risk factors for um, sexual trafficking, for sexual assault, again for physical assault, not just for women but for children and men as well. And even being proximate to those experiences can be very distressing for the people who actually make it over. So that's a second layer of distress. We've talked a little bit about the legal process. Um, there is not a refugee I've spoken to or a refugee with the legal team that I've worked with, and I see that our representative from IRAP is there, and he will talk about that experience in more detail. But the experience of going through the resettlement process is systematically described as traumatizing and distressing, interrogatory, and very often hostile, whether or not that's the intent of the adjudicators who are hearing their cases. Imagine having fled a horrible situation and now being asked to recount the story again and again and again with the presumption that that you are telling a lie. And this is not to <laughs> deny that there are security concerns and fraud concerns, but for the, many, the majority of the individuals who I have seen who have fled under uh, with the best of intentions of survival um, and to have to recount and uh, have their credibility being challenged is really deeply humiliating and traumatizing. And often they present that as their most significant event rather than the actual events which caused them to flee in the first place. And then once they get here, 
acculturation. There are, you know, the thought of being in America and being safe can sustain refugees for a long period of time. But once they get here, they very quickly realize the life is not easy in the United States. They have to get a job. Often it will be a minimum wage job. Their issues around English is not as good as they thought it would be. Many have exper are experiencing racism or um, hostility based on their religion for the first time in their life. And they realize that life is truly just beginning. And often we see uh, depression setting in after three or four months as people realize the extent to which they'll have to rebuild their lives. And so when they come to the refugee clinic, they will often present with a variety of symptoms which can be rather protein and can be really challenging for us to, to, to sort out. Anxiety, absolutely, in a variety of ways. Patients rarely present with depression, I'm feeling depressed, or I have PTSD. Rather, they'll often present with headaches or pain or general distress, and it's our challenge to try to put a diagnosis on it for the purpose of treatment, but also try to find a way to manage that distress. There's a lot that can be said about the what we call the cultural expressions or idioms of distress. And I think those are very relevant, particularly when you're doing longitudinal care for a patient, the subtle ways in which a patient may signal to you that they are experiencing something. But I actually found in the screening process that if by listening carefully, Patients from abroad present the same kinds of symptoms that patients here do, and it's not that difficult, I think, over time to make a diagnosis of PTSD or depression, which is kind of um, reassuring. It reminds you of the universality of human experience, including the universality of human biology in the presentation of mental illness. So patients will describe, say, depression. I'm so tired, I can't get out of bed. I'm so sad about the people I've left behind. home. And the symptoms related to PTSD, I don't like to leave the house. The door slams and I jump, and I hear a sound outside and I want to hide on the floor. These are symptoms that uh, a lot of our trainees are very anxious about missing cultural expressions, but in fact, I think they have the skills to recognize fairly universal symptoms. I wanted to draw a little bit of attention to the significant history of sexual assault that our patients experience, both men and women. And I think this is something that we really had to open our eyes to over time. And aside from the sometimes the sexual assaults they might have experienced, which might be their index event, or, um, there are other things that we have learned over time. Detention itself, both for men and women, is very much a risk factor for sexual assault. Not only having experienced it, but having witnessed it or being forced to participate in, it, in others. Um, flight is clearly a risk factor for women. And we've learned that the assaults can happen not often just by strangers, but their families can be colluding in it as well. So it took me a while to clue into this case. A woman who basically signaled to me, uh, my husband made me visit his friends every night, and I didn't like them. And over time, I realized that her husband was prostituting her in order to get money for their trip, and this was deeply distressing. And of course, some conflicts, even more than others, uh, rape is well known as having been been used as a weapon of war. Um, when I began this work, I think I felt like it was part of my responsibility to explore all that trauma and get the details of it in the kind of model that we use here, which is catharsis is necessary in order to resolve it. But I think over time we've learned that merely hearing it, acknowledging it, even it's an oblique way, I understand what happened. I am so sorry that it happened to you. Many other women have gone through that too. It can be the beginning of a use of a poor and hopefully the beginning of a healing relationship. Over time, we have learned that there's no single best way to treat our refugees. You know, I think we began by having visions of a clinic that would be there and present for people for 18 months or two years in which refugees would be able to come and see us on a weekly basis and they would get wraparound care. It turns out this may not be actually what they want, and it's the whole experience has been a reminder in cultural humility and listening to the patients. Rather, we've learned that at the beginning, certainly after resettlement, there's an intense need for stabilization. Patients come to us saying, please help me sleep so that I can get to work and go to English class and become a success in America. And let me tell you, there is no better way to be a hero to a patient than <coughs> helping them get to sleep so that the nightmares resolve and they can stay awake in English class the next day. So I think, I think how we sometimes think about it is that the first three months can be a period of stabilization, help them resolve the pain, help them connect with their primary care doctors, work closely to resolve the most acute distresses. And then we tried to say, we're, we'd like to be open for you should you want to come back. And that longer-term therapy or treatment or trauma-focused work um, 
uh, we keep the door open for them. And I think there's been a lot of discussion amongst medical providers about why that is. What kind of failure of outreach have we, have we done? Why can't we bring them in to therapy? Well, it's not true that we've failed to engage refugees as a whole. Um, there are tremendous resource issues, which I'll talk about in a, sec in a second. But I note my colleague, Michelle Silva, is sitting in the audience, who's had much better success by doing groups that are focused around less obviously mental health focused issues in the community. So she works with in schools with uh, kids after school um, and she's able to do work there which is focused on acculturation and management and affect management or she's done parenting groups at the refugee center which bring people together around topics that are familiar that are not necessarily about the trauma that they've been to which provide opportunities for solidarity. We've used a variety of particular models. Many of them have been successful. I think the biggest thing is being able to tell refugees that there are ways that we can help you when you are ready. My colleague Ani has talked about barriers to care. There are so many. So we've been very lucky to have received uh, requests from physicians in the community saying, we'd love to take on refugees. But as Ani said, this is not an easy task. Insurance is a barrier to care. Translation is a huge barrier to care. Uh, most physicians can't afford <coughs> to pay for an agency interpreter and it's not reimbursed. Um, in fact, we had a wonderful social worker therapist who paid out of pocket for a therapist, for, for a translator for two years for one of her patients until that arrangement just no longer worked. Um, we know that uh, having refugees, especially really resettled refugees, is time intensive and very disruptive for clinics. They may not appear on time. They may appear late. They may appear with their entire family and the mother-in-law. And so managing refugees is managing an entire family. And it can be very challenging for the flow of a busy clinic. Lots of physicians, and I, I apologize, I, mean, I tend to default to the word physicians, but we know that there are providers of a variety of backgrounds who have worked with refugees in the communities and we're grateful actually by the huge multidisciplinary interest that we've had in this population. We know that providers are very concerned about cultural competence. They don't know, they don't want to break refugees anymore and so they don't know if they can manage the cultural issues. Uh, there's an issue of compassion fatigue. If you get designated as a provider who's able to take on an Arabic speaking patient, before you know it, every Arabic speaking patient in the state is going to be coming your way. And that's great, except that that is hard for a single provider to feel like they're responsible for the health care of an entire community. And that's understandable too. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, which is countertransference or dis distress. So, as, uh, I have absolutely heard from clinics and from mental health workers and line staff, um, but why are we taking on these people? You know, just because we're in the health profession doesn't mean that everyone is open to all the patients that may come through their doors. And I've heard individuals say, why are we here providing health care to foreigners when we can't even provide for basic health care of our own people in a time of budget cutbacks? And I think my, and I, over time, I've realized that's an understandable response by people because everyone is trying to do more with less for more people. And I feel like if we had a better health care system that actually provided comprehensiveness and a universality of access to everyone, not just refugees, we'd be in a better position to serve all of our patients, including refugees. I'd like to note that as a whole, our refugees are interesting, diverse, uh, uh, delightful to engage with, they are incredibly resilient, and I hope we talk about that word over the course of the day. We know that we're seeing the people who have survived the most and have been able to navigate their way here. These are individuals who don't want to be sick. They don't want to be seeing the doctor. They're not flooding our emergency room. They're not flooding the crisis units. They want to get better so they can be a success in America, and mostly they will be. They have low rates of substance use. They have low rates of criminal justice involvement, and as a whole, they're very motivated to do well. I wanted to end on a note. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw this article. I encourage you to read it from The New Yorker a few weeks ago. It's just beautifully written, as all things are in The New Yorker. And then it talks about a phenomena in Sweden of refugee children who fall into a deep sleep, a uniquely Swedish phenomenon uh, related to their legal status. And in the Swedish consensus report that's discussed in the article, the uh, sort of diagnosis for this is that 
the psychological distress that these individuals are facing is related to the feelings of insecurity. <coughs> that if only we could create some space for stability for individuals, and that is, uh, that is often what is needed, being told that they can stay in Sweden, is what's needed to resolve this. And I bring this up because fundamentally what I think our work is about is about creating a safe space for our individuals to know that they've got a place where they can heal over time and at their pace. And I also think it's about creating solidarity. So I understand that much of the day will be focused on how to connect with refugees around the world as well as here. But for me, I could not do this work if it wasn't for the solidarity that I experienced with my colleagues, with my colleague Ani, who I work with on Wednesdays, with the folks from the resettlement agency, who I hear, uh, with uh, Steve and his colleagues from, from IRAP. Uh, solidarity goes always, not just to work with the refugees, but with our colleagues as well. It's the only antidote to very difficult work in a time, I think, of some political despair. So I am delighted to see you here, and I look forward to the conversations and the solidarity that I hope we create. Thank you. Thank you so much for three very thoughtful and concise um, presentation. So we wanted to have a discussion around advocacy and how do we advocate for our patients, but I think before we do that, uh, I want to open it up and give you a chance to ask questions um, from our panelists. We do have a bit, bit of a time. We have about 20 minutes. Excuse me. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Is there, is there, I think there's a microphone in front of you. Just push the Just button. Push the button yeah. Turns green. Yeah. As an advocate for refugees, um, working with them day by day, week by week, it's my impression that everyone needs some sort of, we don't want to call it mental health because that turns people off, but if people don't come to seeking um, psychiatric care or mental health care or come to providers talking about how they can't sleep and, um, and, the, and their worries and why they can't sleep, that almost everybody has that problem. And that there should be some universal, it seems to me, and I don't really know about all the programs that happen, but I think the one in the, with the parents and the school children sounds really wonderful and that everyone should have that opportunity. Do you mean uh, so that refugees don't have to explicitly individually seek the care, but we providers should assume that there's going to be a need for some support for everyone. Maybe there's I, some I do shame think or that, stigma. I do think that, yes, I think that there, it should be a universal offering of, of care, maybe in groups, I'm, I'm not sure. If you don't mind, could you just introduce yourself too? My name is Carol Koenig. I'm a family nurse practitioner. I'm retired and have been a professor at Yale at the School of Nursing. And right now I'm working through JCAR and IRIS with and helping individual refugees. Thank you. So we get a couple of questions and then we have you guys address it. So maybe get maybe two more. Marsha? Sometimes think thank you. I sometimes think it's just um, you know, Yale and what you're doing through the hospital and through IRIS and IRAP, I mean, it, refugees who end up here are in a way in a privileged position. Um, and so I was wondering if you've given us these wonderful presentations about what you're doing, is that replicated in other parts of the country? You know, is it sort of unique to this particular community? Can you talk about the sort of nationwide scope of asylum, medicine, refugee medicine, and so forth, to give a little broader um, sort of framework for it? Please. Hi, I'm Christina Castellani. I'm with the International Institute of Connecticut. We're based out of Bridgeport, and we work with refugees and immigrants. Uh, I specifically work with refugees and asylum seekers with our Survivors of Torture program. Um, so I was really inspired to hear from Dr. Kate McKenzie about her work with survivors of torture. Um, but one of the things that we're always seeing is we have our, our clients come in, and, and they really, you know, they want to hit the ground running. Like, 
like it was mentioned, you know, they really want to get those jobs and just move forward with their lives starting in America. But there is an obvious need for mental health, but there's also huge stigma and taboo. So I, I would like to hear a little bit about how you approach that. Um, we've had some of our clients talk about how, you know, therapy is stealing, stealing their soul or sucking their soul. So, you know, there's a lot of barriers for them as well as for their children. So I, I, I'd be curious to hear some ways. <coughs> start a little bit about how to do the outreach. So I think as a whole, primary care providers have gotten better and are seeking education and training about identifying the mental health issues that refugees will experience, whether or not they explicitly flag them. In fact, we get many referrals for mental health care. Um, and then it's very challenging. Often refugees themselves do not want to come and see a psychiatrist. In fact, my first question is, were you aware that you were seeing a psychiatrist today and do you really want to speak to me? Um, and uh, then there's the larger question, and, and I think there is stigma, there are issues of time, I think there is the absurd fragmentation of our health care system. I know what we hear again and again is, why do I need to see one doctor for my eye, and another for my shoulder, and then another person for mental health, and I can only come at Wednesdays at 6 o'clock, but I have other things. I mean, I think you don't need to be a refugee to find our current system overwhelming, and the text messages that they get for reminder appointments can be daunting. So uh, I think there are a lot of barriers just to getting into the system. Um, and, uh, and once they get, even if they can overcome the stigma. Uh, we absolutely have challenges around resources. We don't always have people available to do therapy, and our numbers have ebbed and flowed over the years. And by the time we have somebody, the patient may have moved on or have moved out of state or be busy with the job and the family. It would be great if we could have something that was more flexible and open so that as needed, because this actually reflects people's lives, right? They may need intense care, hope at one time, have a period of stability, get re-triggered by an event and need to come back in, and, and we don't do that well for most people, and it's particularly challenging when there's translation and, you know, for refugees. So um, it may well be better if it's end up being situated in the community, as Michelle is doing, um, but you're identifying very real barriers. As it turns out, we do have, oh, I've been told, an unusual model with uh, IRIS, a resettlement agency, that what we do is uh, very rare. And I think Ani can talk a little bit more about the national models for this. So, oh, yeah, that's responding a little bit to your question, but mainly to you, uh, Marsha. So there's actually, uh, there's actually a group of uh, healthcare providers of various disciplines, actually, resettlement coordinators are also part of this. We actually now have a society of refugee health care providers. And um, uh, that's, you know, about f four or 500 people every year actually assemble together to talk about, it happens once a year in June, uh, to talk about just various programs they're doing, how we can improve health care, you know, both research, clinical resettlement, all sorts of issues. But the point is just that there are many people doing this across the country. I think each model is very different. Ours is sort of an academic academic community partnership. That's not that common, though there's a few. Uh, actually, there's a group in Minnesota. They've had the, uh, I think they call it the Center for International Health. And they're actually, uh, sort of the forerunners of uh, refugee, especially the health part of it. Uh, and there's other groups. Um, and again, it's very, very variable in terms of how well it's structured. But sort of the answer is yes, there's a lot happening. And it's just taken various faces and forms, shapes and forms. And some are more structured than others. And in response to your question about the, the stigma in general, I mean, that's one of the good things that we are able to do here, because we see them in a primary care setting in the beginning. and. Um, so happens that I'm also a psychiatrist, and so we do some sort of screening um, initially, but even if I wasn't a psychiatrist, I mean, the, the uh, general refugee guidelines also say to really do that screening within the primary care center and not to send everybody, you know, for a mental health referral, uh, saying, you know, you really need to see a psychiatrist, you know, just because of the trauma we face. We, we don't do that. We sort of screen them in that very somewhat safe um, primary care setting, and then we really, 
you know, sort of triage them into different levels. I mean, mental health or mental illness is such a nebulous thing. You know, how do you, when do you classify that somebody is really suffering from something or not? We see various levels of distress. So it's only when we feel that some, somebody is seriously impaired from their, you know, whatever they're going through, that we then really seek to send them to uh, specialized mental health uh, evaluation and treatment. Uh, and usually in those cases, people are fairly amenable and willing, I think, for treatment because they're in that much distress. But there's a whole group of people sort of in the middle uh, who are definitely in distress, but maybe it's not that impairing. Maybe they're still sort of able to work, do some of the daily things. And we've tried to create other things for them. Um, we keep going back to Michelle, who's, who's actually done some uh, groups in the community for parents and mothers and children. And then we've actually had some of our trainees go and do some health literacy classes at IRIS. One of them was in stress management, so it was a very non-threatening environment. Uh, and actually, one of the social workers within IRIS is actually trying to set up her, her own little sort of little therapy, uh, you know, morning for refugees, which there are other complications within that, you know, is she a case manager? Is she a therapist for a particular person? So that's a whole other um, issue. But but we, we have tried to incorporate other things sort of within the larger community. And a lot of things we do, like uh, Amanda at Iris, who's a social worker, she does these sewing groups, gardening groups, yoga. I mean, those are all, we don't call that necessarily mental health treatment, but they're all part of supporting them. So so I, I guess there's just various things we try to do with the, within the limited resources we have. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I've been fortunate to partner with Iris, and Leslie's here, and it's Maya and Ani have mentioned, um, because it's such an enthusiastic, I think, an energetic group of people, and most of my work has concentrated in, in the community, has been mentioned, and really around education and normalizing the experience of being displaced and in a new setting. What does that mean? Um, as a, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, mainly working for many years with Central American um, immigrants and many of the distress and acculturative stressors that come with that community or that we've seen is not unlike much of the distress experienced by the refugees in, in the New Haven area. So much of my work has been, again, led by IRIS and the collaboration that's already there, working with children in their after school program, creating relationships, normalizing that being in a new school in a new setting is, is difficult and with the parents, again, the distress of being in a new place. What does it mean to be a parent in the United States? How do I not lose my child to this new system? And some of our conversations with Maya and Ani have been around, as was mentioned, the universality, that much of their distress is not unlike what we see here. And when you speak to any parent or any child, in addition, of course, to the, to the context that they're in. But I think that sums up a little. I don't want to take too much time. Can I, oops, sorry. No, you had it. Well, for Professor Inslee. My experience living in this community of New Haven is that we are so uniquely uh, uh, fortunate between this outstanding resettlement, refugee resettlement agency of IRIS, which is, is phenomenal, and the programs that we have, as well as the community at Yale. I don't think that this sort of uh, cohesive, outstanding set of programs is replicated very many places in the country. Of course, New York, you have everything, and Boston as well, maybe Los Angeles. But we really have a model here, and, and it's somewhat serendipitous how everything has come together. Uh, now, I think that uh, Ani talked about a conference we'll be going to in June, the North American uh, Refugee Health <laughs> Com healthcare conference. That's where people who do the work that we do uh, get together, and, and it's a good community as well. It's from those international organizations that we see how unique New Haven is. And finally, I just want to throw one thing out here, which is, again, unique to our community, but I'm not sure if any of you read the um, Times the we can review every Sunday, and if you've noted that uh, graphic novel that's been going on, do you know what I'm talking about? So just as a little coincidence, the, yeah, Jake Halpern lives in New Haven, as does Michael Sloan. So there's something that's beyond just the institutions that we have in New Haven that makes it a really special place. 
And I'm sorry, I thought about that because of what Michelle said and the story of the family and the kids going to school. Tell me the acronym JCAR. Yes, I'm sorry, the coordinator of JCAR, we're the Jewish Community Alliance for Refugee Resettlement. We're a co sponsor for IRIS, and we are the sponsor of that family in the cartoon. Oh, um, right. And so I think what, and Carol works with us as well, I think what I'm hearing is when you, you know, I'm a part of being an exemplary model has created these um, co sponsorships. So there's groups across the state now sponsoring refugees. We spend intense time with them. We learn their mental health issues, but we have for what to do with that. And so it seems to me many times I've said to Iris, we you know, co-sponsors need um, support. Uh, so if we could have a workshop where we can come together and we can deal with what what do I do when the family says to me my kid's not sleeping he won't go into the kitchen at night he won't go to the bathroom by himself I told the school they're not doing anything I mean we carry this pain around with us because we don't know how to help them Hi, Dennis Wang, first year medical student. Um, have the pleasure to work with Dr. McKenzie and um, some of the panelists up there. Um, I was, I know that Iris likes to talk about the co-sponsorship model as certainly something that has drastically um, increased the capacity of Iris to be able to resettle refugees. I think they doubled from 2015 to 2016. Um, but I've also had discussions with people about, you know, co-sponsorship groups needing more support, things that co-sponsorship groups do very well, um, things that, you know, potentially there could be some improvement on. And I also know that um, co-sponsorship is something that Canada does a little bit. So I was wondering if any of you could talk sort of more broadly about co-sponsorship, where it fits in, um, what it does well, where there could be some improvement. Um, my name is Chafari Abata. I'm, uh, uh, from Ethiopia, and uh, uh, most of I have lived in New Haven uh, for over 12 years, and most of my friends, uh, family members, are uh, refugees from Ethiopia, Eritrea, and um, Somalia and South Sudan. Uh, I must uh, admit, I'm trying to get a little uh, bored right now because there is no mention of what refugees themselves or the sufferers themselves do about all these stressors, problems. There is nothing I heard so far. It is definitely, I know, I, I risk closely. I have worked with them of other issues. But the most um, resilient thing about refugees especially speaking of the communities, the families I know in New Haven is uh, just their, their own strengths. They have associations, uh, Ethiopian, Eritrean, uh, you know, community around here, uh, Greater New Haven, New Haven um, Hartford, and also Bridgeport, Waterbury, uh, but their associations are not even, you know, registered or uh, have no office, they tend to be more informal, just as they want it. And, uh, you know, they come together on burials or uh, when family problems uh, occur and all that. And some sort of appreciation to that and uh, just a reach out, a mention, including from meetings like this, will, be, will, will take a long way. You know? Thanks. Question, reminding us that the refugees have their own communities and they draw a lot of support from those. So let me just uh, turn it over, and I know we have Iris representative as well, if they want to talk about the co community co-sponsorship question, but uh, anybody wants to take on? Uh, a couple of things. Let me begin with the co-sponsorship question. Um, yes, I actually think that any co-sponsorship group uh, would benefit from some training in how to manage and triage mental health issues and how to manage their own distress, vicarious trauma, and compassion fatigue, because I think these are very real issues. Um, we've also had discussions with, um, with Iris about, as we learn from the first wave
families, co-sponsorship families, and experiences about whether and how to bring mental health and physicians on board at the very beginning so that co-sponsorship groups are not in the position of having to find help after a situation has arisen, because, because that's always frantic. And over the last year, Ani and I have tried to reach out to other hospitals, community clinics, places where refugees ought to be getting their care to try to do work on that. That has actually turned out to be very challenging, because clinics have their own barriers to care, often beginning around translation. We can't take on these patients because of their insurance. We can't take on these patients because of translation. And so then patients get shunted back to Yale. And I use the word shunted because I don't think that if anyone is traveling an hour and a half for care, that's great care um, or accessible care. So that's a little bit about some of the weaknesses of the co-sponsorship model. But yes, it has been done. I think one of the reasons why Canada does it better in a certain way, and I'm Canadian, so um, by the way, is, uh, is, uh, is I do think there is a universality of access to social services, including health care. That just takes a huge issue off the table, a huge case management piece off the table from the beginning. I agree with you. We didn't talk about the refugee experience from the position of recently resettled refugees, partially because it feels a bit presumptuous, but also because we don't know that much about it. Um, and we need to find a way to incorporate that in a more systematic way into the work that we do. And honestly, you know, if you uh, <coughs> see some of the intimate conversation going on among refugees, it is more about the cultural expertise of so-called culturally sensitive professionals than the cultural insensitivity of more broader general service I believe that, actually. And one of the challenges, you don't get those conversations and hear those details when you're coming into it on the outside. And so how do we glean that information in a way that's unvarnished and true so that we can learn from it. So maybe we'll be. All right, come. <laughs> uh, Leslie, I don't want to put you on the spot to add about the co sponsorship model. But just, yeah, very anecdotally, I can just add on to what Maya said about I mean, it's been great. I think sort of the refugee. Uh, I, I can just speak loudly. I mean, refugees just, I think, tend to get a lot of individual support, you know, from co-sponsorship groups. But at the same time, sometimes we feel maybe they haven't had that much experience in navigating some of the health challenges and addressing some of the immediate health issues. Because, for instance, our health coordinator partners at IRIS have done this for years, and they've worked with us, so they have more, they sort of know the next steps, you know, when somebody comes to them for that. So. Totally, and I totally agree about doing workshops. I mean, we've started this annual healthcare conference now. We did that twice, but it's very short. We have, we really have to expand that and include different groups and include really various levels of, of healthcare, which, which you're hoping to do over time. But sorry, Leslie, I, I don't know if you had. I'll, I'll just uh, introduce myself. I'm Leslie, I'm the health promoter, and I work with a small team at IRIS um, in the health department. Um, and I have the great pleasure of working with everybody up here. And uh, as has been mentioned, uh, we have such a great partnership uh, between Iris and the folks at Yale who run the refugee clinic. And I do believe we're pretty unique in the country um, as far as refugee resettlements having such a partnership with the um, hospital like that. So th that being said, um, to talk about the co-sponsor groups, as was mentioned also, in IRIS's effort back in 2015 to double the numbers of refugees that we resettled, largely in, spon in response to the Syrian crisis, the worldwide uh, crisis, we turned to the co-sponsorship model, which is also pretty unique in the country. Canada certainly does it. Um, but Connecticut is unique in that. We had such an outpouring of support from individuals and groups that contacted IRIS to say, hey, what can we do? Um, so we turned to the co-sponsors and therefore we're able to double our numbers. So co-sponsor groups act like a, a mini IRIS. We get only one day of intensive training for the representatives of the group and each department goes over um, the aspects that they should know to 
successfully resettle their families. So with health, we get about an hour and a half between um, health and mental health issues, woefully inadequate. Um, and your feedback, um, both Jean and Carol, is very important. And we certainly do hope to take what we've learned so far and um, have some type of workshops, things like that. And very fortunately, a group that Cave is overseeing of um, MPH students recently came to Iris and said, hey, we'd love to do some research. What can we do? So this group are going to be looking into mental health resources throughout the state uh, based on experiences that were brought up that we've had, um, noticing that it's just super tough to find mental health providers for anyone, let alone those that provide interpreters, accept Medicaid, um, are accepting new patients, and have any level of cultural competency dealing with clients from the countries that we deal with. So um, we're looking into that. We also have another group that's also doing some form of research um, based on the co-sponsorship group from the past year, um, lessons learned and how to strengthen that. So yeah, it's, it's, we couldn't have done it without you, so thank you. And uh, yeah, I think that's good. Um, it's 1030. You have a well-deserved coffee break coming up. So I want to just thank the panelists again for three wonderful presentations.